for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm looking forward to kind of diving deeper into this topic with you when we're talking about um, when we've maybe tried the fading in strategy or we don't have the option to use the fading in strategy and need kind of some other tools in our toolbox, what some of those might look like. Um, so first, uh, we definitely want to say thank you to the Gordon and Marilyn Macklin Foundation. Um, they provided a grant to SMA, which has allowed us to present several of these webinars this past year, as well as engage in lots of other advocacy and education and support programs um, for individuals with SM and those working with those individuals. So we're very grateful to them for that grant. So a quick overview of our agenda tonight, we're gonna to talk a little bit about kind of the basics of fading in and what some of the benefits might be, what some of the barriers might be, and maybe situations you might encounter where um, that strategy may not be the most appropriate or may not be the right strategy yet for that situation. We're gonna talk about scaffolding and successive approximation and how those um, strategies really fit into all of the other activities and strategies that we talk about the rest of the night. We're gonna talk about some specific ways to help students um, establish movement if that's an area of difficulty, work on establishing airflow, work on establishing voicing, some of those prerequisite skills that kids might need to work on before they get to the stage where they're ready to use spoken words. Um, we'll talk about some specific strategies to help kids move from making individual sounds to making whole words, and then just kind of some additional strategies to keep in mind as you're working on speaking in new situations. Um, we will have some time for questions at the end, but if you have a question throughout, feel free to put it in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on that as I go so I can kind of stop and clarify things or add more if we need more information. So um, if you uh, have attended other SMA webinars um, or have seen some of our publications, you're probably familiar with this cycle. Uh, this is the cycle of negative reinforcement. And um, although many of you may be familiar with it, I think it's important just to review briefly because understanding how this cycle works really impacts how we design our therapy, um, how we help support our kids in meeting their goals, how we break things down into smaller goals and help them to find success. And so I wanna make sure we're all on the same page with that. So. If we start at the top of this cycle where it says the child is prompted to engage verbally or behaviorally, you might env envision a situation where the child is in maybe a less familiar setting like the grocery store with their parent and they run into someone like the parent's coworker who maybe the child doesn't know at all or doesn't know very well. And so the coworker is chatting with the parent and says something to the child like, oh, Emily, I haven't seen you in so long. How old are you now? And ask the child a question. So the child's prompted to engage verbally in that situation. That's probably a stressful situation for that child. And so they experience some level of distress and inhibition. They might hide behind mom. They might kind of like crawl up under mom's coat. They might turn away from the interaction, look at the floor, look at the ceiling, even walk away completely from the interaction. And so those in the environment, the adults in the environment, observe that level of distress. And they can see this child is uncomfortable. Um, they're feeling very stressed out. They're feeling very nervous. They're not able to answer this question. And so as most adults would, the adults in that situation have a very empathic response. They want the child to feel better. They want this awkward moment to end. And so what usually happens is one of the adults, like the parent, may jump in and answer the question for the child and say something like, oh, she just turned seven last week. How about you? How are your kids doing? How old are they now? And kind of shift the topic of conversation to something else. And so in the short term, what happens is that everyone in that situation feels some level of relief. So the parent feels a level of relief because we've kind of steered the conversation away from the situation where maybe her child was looking rude or disrespectful or uncomfortable. The child feels relief because they weren't pressed to engage in that situation that was very scary or difficult for them. Um, and the coworker feels relief because they're probably not even sure what just happened. They thought they were asking a friendly question. The child wasn't able to answer it. And so they're probably feeling a little bit like, you know, I asked a simple question. Why did that make them so upset? Why was that so uncomfortable? And so we've now kind of moved through that awkward moment. Everyone feels the short-term sense of relief. However, the problem is um, what we what's just happened is what we call the cycle of negative reinforcement. So the child has learned when I engage in these avoidance behaviors, turning away, hiding behind mom, looking at the ground, not answering, mom will jump in and rescue me or answer the question for me. And I don't have to do this big, scary thing. Mom will do it for me. And so as this happens over and over and over and over again, these um, avoidance techniques or these avoidance behaviors become very, very, very reinforced, which means they become very ingrained. 
they become the default response pathway for the child. And so you can imagine a child, by the time they get to early school age, like kindergarten or first grade, they may have been asked hundreds or thousands of questions. They may have been prompted to respond verbally in hundreds or thousands of situations and not been able to do so. And so they've got this very, very strong avoidance loop um, or response pathway in the brain. And so things to keep in mind as we are planning therapy with our students with SM is that we really want to um, create a new pathway in the brain. We wanna create lots and lots of successful trials and positively reinforce kids being able to engage verbally um, in whatever way they're able to, so that that becomes the new default pathway. So other things to think in mind as we're kind of framing therapy and planning goals for the students that we work with. Um, one of the things that we can do as we think back to this negative reinforcement cycle, we can intervene at the step where the people in the environment are having an empathic response, where the parent is jumping in and answering the question. And so we can teach the adults in the environment, whether that's parents, teachers, extended family members, coaches, um, to change their responses or to change the way that they're prompting the student so that we're preventing that cycle of negative reinforcement from occurring and instead having something more positive and more pro-social occur. So the student starts to learn more um, engaging in socialization behaviors. We also wanna make sure we're using these concepts of scaffolding and shaping and successive approximations, which we'll talk more about in a minute, to really break goals down into smaller and more manageable steps for students. So in that situation, the student may not have been ready to just answer a question from a stranger on the spot, but there may have been ways to break that down where maybe mom and the student could step away, mom could re-ask the question, the student answers mom, and then mom reflects that answer back to the adult or making some types of modifications there so that the student was able to participate successfully in the interaction. And as I was saying, we're trying to create this new default pathway in the brain. Um, so this could require thousands and thousands of successful trials in order for this to become the child's new default response to things, in order for it to become stronger than that avoidance loop that has been so reinforced over time. So um, I saw uh, one article that said the average teacher, so this is for school age children, asks anywhere between 300 and 400 questions a day. Now, obviously those, all, those aren't all geared towards the same single student, but if you're thinking about the fact that a student in their classroom is being asked, you know, potentially hundreds of questions per day by um, their classroom teacher, by their specials teachers, by people in the cafeteria, by people at the office, by the nurses, by their peers. There's that's a lot of opportunities for them to not respond and have not responding be reinforced. So those pathways become really strong. And our job as clinicians, as caregivers, as people who are supporting these students really becomes giving them as many successful trials as possible to create that new pathway. And so as I tell my students, we have to practice until it gets boring. We have to practice over and over and over until this isn't a scary thing anymore, until it doesn't bother us at all anymore, and it becomes so boring, you can do it easy, no problem. And then we still practice it a little bit more. So there's lots and lots of repetition that's key to change the brain. So just to touch briefly on the topic of fading in, although this isn't the focus of our, our presentation tonight, um, again, I wanna make sure you kind of have an idea of what this looks like. Again, if you've attended other SMA events or trainings, you've probably seen this graphic or a similar one before. And so when we talk about fading in, we talk about this process where we have the child and someone familiar, usually a parent who the child's able to talk to. And the goal with doing a fade in is to pass the talking baton or to help the child become verbal with a new person um, by slowly having them move into the interaction in a way that the child can still stay comfortable with and is eventually able to talk to them. And so the basic premise is if you look at this diagram, the parent and child are over here on the carpet doing an activity. Um, the parent is asking the child lots of questions, making lots of comments, making sure they're very verbal in this activity to keep those verbalizations up. The new adult, like perhaps a teacher, would start further away from the interaction over here at number one and maybe look completely unengaged initially. They might be on a computer, they might be taking notes, um, really not engaging at all with the parent and child. And then as the child is able to keep verbalizing, that new adult can move a little bit closer to number two and then kind of sit on the edge of the carpet at number three and then eventually move to the interaction itself and start to make some comments and eventually ask a question. 
um, typically in a fade in as that new adult is using those questioning skills, asking the child some questions, the child is able to answer the new adult successfully. And then the parent, once the child's successfully verbal and doing so consistently, the parent can then follow that same process to fade themselves out. So they would kind of back off to the corner of the carpet and then maybe back to a table, maybe leave the room for a few minutes. And so it's this very um, structured process of introducing a new person in very incremental steps, helping the child to feel comfortable and successful and communicate with them, and then slowly fading that comfortable person out so that now the, the talking baton has been passed to this new individual. And I would say in most instances, this works really well for our kids with SM. Um, most of my students benefit from this. Most of my students can transfer speech to new adults or peers using some version of a fade-in. Um, sometimes it takes multiple sessions. Sometimes it goes very quickly. There's a lot of different variables that occur. But I was finding um, and I was hearing among some of my colleagues that sometimes the strategy doesn't work or it doesn't work yet. Um, and so we want to talk about what other tools do we have to address those situations. So if we've tried to fade in a couple of times, we've tried a couple of modifications and it's just not working, what other options do we have to help support speech or what other prerequisite skills do we need to address so that the child can communicate successfully? So thinking about this, we know fade-ins work really well when a familiar speaking partner like a parent is available for the fade-in sessions, whether those are taking place at a clinic, in the community, at a school. The child is able to speak to that person in the new environment, or the new person is able to come to a familiar environment, like go to the child's house or a nearby playground or somewhere the child's very consistently verbal. Um, and the child is responsive to the CDI, the child-directed interaction, and the VDI prompts, and is able to stay verbal throughout the interaction. When all those factors are true, fade-ins usually go pretty smoothly, and we're able to transfer speech pretty smoothly. However, there may be situations where not all of those factors are true. Um, so during COVID, when I worked in a school, there were two full years where parents were not allowed in the building at all. And so I had a brand new kindergartner start and she was completely nonverbal anywhere outside of the house. And we had the challenge of trying to figure out how can we establish speech when we can't get any familiar speaking partners into the building and we have masks on and all of these other things. Um, so sometimes parents are not available, maybe due to a work schedule, maybe due to transportation, maybe due to school policies. So we may not be able to get them into the new environment. Um, in other situations, you may have a child who has very rigid boundaries about where they are and are not able to speak. And so sometimes there's those kids that they can talk at home to their parent, they can talk in the car to their parent, but as soon as they get out of the car, whether it's at school or somewhere in the community or at a playground, they're not able to talk at all because there's just very clear boundaries of anywhere outside the car, I can't talk. Um, and so there may be situations where even though the person is familiar and even though the child's very verbal with that person in some situations, that's not yet transferring to a new environment, even if there's no new people around. And so the child's not yet ready for that fade in. Um, the new person may not be able to come meet the child at a familiar environment or the prompting techniques, the CDI and VDI prompts may not be enough to keep the child verbal if they're still kind of honing those. And I see your question, what is CDI and VDI? And that is our next slide. So great question, great transition. Um, so just a quick review, some of you may be familiar with these terms CDI and VDI, some of you this may be new to you. Um, these are based on the concept of parent-child interaction therapy adapted for SM or PCIT-SM. And basically it's two sets of skills, what we call child-directed interaction skills or CDI and the verbally-directed interaction skills or VDI. Um, when we're using the child-directed interaction skills, the goal for these skills is to provide warm-up time for students, to allow them to establish comfort in a new situation or to rebuild rapport with them after we've just pushed them and kind of challenged them a little bit. During the portion of our sessions or our treatment period where we're not, where we're using these CDI skills, we're not expecting the child to talk to us. We're not expecting verbalizations. We're not pushing them to talk. And so what that means is the adult is not asking any questions during this time. They're only making comments that don't put pressure on the child to talk. So just um, behavioral descriptions, they're just making comments about things that are happening. And so that usually entails using these five skills, which we call the pride skills. And those are labeled praise, which is using really specific praise for things the child is doing that you want them to continue doing. Great job coming to sit next to me. I love how you're building with those blocks so carefully. Thanks for looking at me while I was talking to you. I love seeing you smile. So giving really specific praises for things that the child's doing. Reflection means if the child does happen to say something spontaneously, um, you can reflect back what they said or repeat what they said to show that you heard it. So if you're walking back to your therapy room with them and you make a comment like, oh, your shirt is so cool, 
and the child says something like, my mom got it for me at Target, you can reflect that back and say, oh, your mom got it for you at Target. And then maybe add a labeled phrase and say, great job telling me that. So reflecting anything the child does say, even though we're not expecting to, sometimes they will say something spontaneous. Imitation refers to following the child's lead and really letting this portion of your session be very child-led, um, looking for things that they're interested in, playing with things the way they're playing with them, if, even if it's a little bit different. Behavioral descriptions mean making neutral comments about either what the child or what you are doing. And these are really helpful because you might be thinking, if I'm in this session with this child, I'm not supposed to ask them any questions. They're not able to talk to me yet. What are we doing during this whole time? Are we just sitting in silence? And so that's where these behavioral descriptions really come in, where you can just describe what you're doing or what the child's doing. Like, oh, I see you putting a green block on top. You're picking out the Zingo game and you're opening the box. I'm going to take out the red board. Here, I'm going to give this to you. It's your turn. Go ahead and pull it. So describing what's happening in the interaction. And then using a genuine amount of enthusiasm and excitement and kind of modulating that to your student or client's needs. Certainly the, the level of enthusiasm and the way we would look enthusiastic with a 14-year-old probably looks very different than working with a four-year-old. And so kind of matching that to your child's personality and needs in developmental stage. So those are the CDI skills. After we use those CDI skills, and we typically start our sessions with some amount of those CDI skills, whether it's five or 10 minutes or maybe a little bit longer if kids need it, we add this other layer of the VDI or the verbally directed interaction skills on top. And so these skills are where we're building and practicing kids' verbal skills. This is where we are expecting them to use their voice and to engage verbally. We are using questions like forced choice questions, which is a multiple choice question. Do you want to play Zingo, do coloring or something else? Or open-ended questions like, what do you wanna do next? We try to stay away from yes, no questions because many kids will answer those non-verbally with a nod or a head shake or a shrug. And we really wanna um, have kids practice using those verbalization skills. So switching it to a forced choice question means it's more likely that you'll get a verbal response instead of that non-verbal. And then as adults are using questions, they follow some of these basic principles, which is allowing five to 10 seconds of wait time after they ask a question before they do anything else to give that child time to respond. Um, if the child does respond non-verbally, like with a shrug or a point, describing what the child's doing, I see you shrugging your shoulders and then asking the question again to make sure we're really prompting them to use those verbal skills. Um, if kids don't answer at all, presenting the question a second time. And sometimes you add a couple extra comments. Um, sometimes you might um, make it a little bit more exciting, but asking the question a second time to give kids another opportunity to respond verbally. And then being thinking about how we can scaffold your situation in order to ensure success. So if you've now asked the question two times and your student's really struggling to answer it, maybe you need to modify something about the interaction so that it's easier for them to engage. So if you've been asking open-ended questions, which are harder questions to answer, change it to a forced choice question. So instead of what did you do this weekend, which might be harder to answer, did you play inside or outside this weekend? Did you play by yourself or with your brother this weekend? Changing it to a forced choice question is likely easier for the student to answer. So thinking about ways to kind of adjust your expectations so that the child is successful in participating. That's a very brief overview. Um, there's a lot more to learn about these skills and they're truly super helpful to use with the selective mutism population. Um, I would recommend the Selective Mutism University which is a free website that you can take training and watch videos and learn a lot more about these skills. Um, there's also more on the SMA website about these skills as well, if you're interested in learning more. So as we're moving forward and kind of talking about tools in our toolbox and supporting speech for, for kids who need that extra support, the three main things we really wanna think about are how can we implement scaffolding? How can we use successive approximation and shaping? And how can we include reinforcement in order to help our kids be more successful with these tasks? And so when we talk about scaffolding, um, I can put the website in the chat when we get to the question part at the end. It's called the Selective Mutism University. So you can Google SM University or I'll share the website at the end. Um, when we talk about scaffolding, we're talking about providing supports or accommodations to the child to help make a goal achievable for them, but then removing those supports once they're no longer needed. And it's important to remember that scaffolding is a dynamic process. It changes as the child's needs and progress changes. And so the support, the scaffolds that a student might need at the very beginning of a school year will likely look different than what they need in the middle of the school year and at the end of the school year. And they should as the child makes progress. And so things that were really helpful and necessary for them to make progress at in September 
may no longer be necessary in December. And so we want to start to take those supports away and foster more independence for our kids so that they're taking ownership of these goals and we're moving them further along in their journey. So we want to always be mindful of making sure we're providing just enough, but not too much support with scaffolding. When we talk about successive approximations and shaping, we're really talking about the process of breaking things down into smaller incremental steps. So really thinking about how can I change just one variable of what I'm asking this child to do to make it a little bit easier or a little bit more manageable for them. The nice thing about successive approximations is when you break things down into lots and lots of little steps, it fosters lots of repeated practice and lots of successes. And so if you think about, you know, you're setting a goal with a child, you know, by the end of this month, I want to be able to order my own donut at Dunkin' Donuts. You might be able to practice that in maybe three steps. But if you break that down into 12 smaller steps, that's 12 times that child is being successful. So that's 12 more repetitions that you're getting on that new bravery pathway in the brain, 12 more successful responses you're getting out of that child. So always thinking about how can we break these down into more incremental steps and foster more practice and more success. The other nice thing about it is when you break things down into smaller steps and you only change things a little bit at a time, you're less likely to trigger that panic or that fight or flight response in the student that you're working with. And so they're often more, they're often better able to engage in your activity and go a little bit further than if you jump too many steps at once and it pushes them too far and they get overwhelmed and kind of we see that shutdown or that avoidance tendency. And then when we talk about reinforcement, I think it's always helpful to keep in mind, especially for our kids that maybe are struggling with um, speaking in new situations or to new people and need more support than just kind of the typical fade in technique. Um, reinforcement can be really helpful. And what we mean by that is something that makes the task rewarding for the child. Often for these kids, because they have engaged in avoidance for so, so long, and that's something they're so used to and almost comfortable with, the idea of engaging verbally, even though these kids really want to talk and want to participate, it's really scary. And it may not be intrinsically motivating initially for these kids. It may not essentially feel good yet. And so we have to help these kids feel like we're recognizing their hard work. We're recognizing that this is important work that they're doing. We're recognizing the effort and the energy they're putting into that. And we're rewarding that. And then as the child progresses as they move along, as they get uh, more fluent and consistent with skills, we can start to fade that reinforcement. We can adjust it over time. Um, I've never worked with a child who needed any kind of extrinsic reinforcement forever. We've always been able to fade it. But sometimes initially, or when you're bumping up against a new hard skill, adding that reinforcement piece can be really helpful in helping kids just get over that next step. Um, so those are good things to keep in mind. So some examples of what scaffolding might look like. Um, if you have a student, and I work in a school in a school setting, so if you have a student who's in a school setting and they're completely nonverbal, there's no one at school that they're talking to, we need to think about ways to get their basic wants and needs met. And so bathroom is always a big one for me, um, being able to communicate if they need to go to the nurse or if they need help with something. And so initially, when that child starts school, they might need to use some kind of nonverbal hand gesture to let the teacher know they need to go to the bathroom. But as we're using that, the child should also actively be working on verbalization skills, on asking to go to the bathroom, on working on that skill with the clinician, and should move to using verbalizations in the classroom with their teacher as soon as that's possible. And once they're able to use those verbalizations, we fade that nonverbal gesture out. They no longer need that. They don't need to rely on the nonverbal. Now it's appropriate to expect them to use a one word request or answer a forced choice question or something like that. And so we put that support in place while they need it, while we're still working to move them forward. Once they no longer need it, we take it away. Another example might be if your child is working on ordering food from a stranger at a restaurant. Initially, they might not be able to just make eye contact with the waiter, say their order, and be able to do that independently. So a way of scaffolding that might be that the parent asks the child a series of forced choice questions about what they want to order while the waiter's standing there in earshot and the parent reflects those responses to the waiter. As they continue to practice this skill and the child gets louder and doesn't need the reflections anymore, the child gets more independent and doesn't need the forced choice questions anymore, the parent is able to fade those strategies out and the child's eventually able to order independently. So we're still moving them forward. Same thing if you're thinking about making a presentation. If the child's not yet able to present to an entire classroom full of peers and teachers, they might initially start by presenting one-on-one -on -one to the teacher, and then maybe to a small group of peers, or maybe to the teacher and a couple of peers nearby. And then again, we start to fade that scaffolding out once they no longer need it. 
So you can think about examples of scaffolding like kids who are learning to swim and use these swimmies or floaties, kids who are learning to ride bikes and ride their training wheels. Those things can be really necessary at first to help them feel safe and help them be willing to engage in the risk and try the new skill and get more comfortable with it and more confident with it. But once they learn that skill, those things then begin to hold them back. And so we don't wanna keep those supports in place longer than we need them. We wanna take them away so that we can allow the child to keep growing and progressing with those skills. When we talk about examples of success of approximation, and there's a lot of ways to talk about this, so I only included a few, but it's thinking about if we have a goal for our child, whether it's your child and you're the caregiver or a child that you're working with as a treating clinician, we're setting a goal for them of something that they've never done before. And then we're thinking about how do we break that down into individual steps? I know a lot of clinicians will talk about this in terms of a bravery ladder or a bravery hierarchy, and they'll work with kids and families to come up with what are the steps. If this is the goal at the very top of what we want to do, what are the smaller steps we can take to get us there on our way there? And so we break things down. So if you've got a goal like a child asking a question to a stranger, like an employee at a bookstore out in the community, someone they've never talked to before, Chances are you wouldn't just walk into the bookstore, walk up to an employee and say, go ahead and ask your question. That might be too hard for a lot of our kids. And so instead, we want to use those successive approximations or shaping and really shape that behavior, starting with something the child can do comfortably and then moving up to the new skill. So it might look like picking a question ahead of time with the child and practice asking the parent in the car on the way to the store, practice asking the parent inside the store when no one else is around, practice asking the parent as you approach the customer service desk asking the parent at the customer service desk while the employee is in earshot, and then asking the employee directly. And there's no single way to break down these tasks into smaller steps. I did it there with an example of five steps. You might have a student who needs to do it in 15 steps because they really need them to be tiny and incremental. You might have a student who can do it in less than that. So just knowing what your kids are capable of and being able to be flexible and modify in the moment. If your child gets stuck, thinking about how can I go back one step or go back half a step and help them practice before we move forward again. Um, there's another example here of, again, if you wanted the child to talk in a new space at school, how you might start with talking to a familiar person in a familiar place, and then as you move through the school building, eventually in the nurse's office, and then eventually to the nurse, but doing that in lots of small steps. Okay, so we're gonna move now to talking about some prerequisite skills that may be helpful for kids to get more comfortable with before they're able to jump right into using their voice to form words and sentences. And so some of the big things I like to look at in my kids who are having trouble getting to that word or sentence level right away are, are they comfortable with movement? Are they comfortable with airflow? And are they comfortable with just the concept of their voice to begin with? So when we think about movement, you may have worked with kids that are just very physically inhibited. They struggle to even walk into a new room. They look very physically frozen. They may um, struggle to sit down on the floor or sit down at a table with a new person. Um, they just kind of linger in the doorway and they're not quite sure what to do. And they really struggle with just basic movements of entering a new space um, and sitting down in a new space or orienting themselves to a new space. And so we may need to work on just helping them feel more physically comfortable and helping them be more behaviorally engaged before we even get to words. I will say some kids will um, be able to speak and use words first and will work on the behavioral engagement later. And other kids will work on the behavioral engagement first and then the words will come later. So there's, again, there's not like a, a tried and true way to always do this, but this might be something to trial if your kid's getting stuck at this point. So it's really helpful to start with really small movements and shape those towards your desired action. So if you've got a student and you want them to practice just handing things back and forth to people, but they're sitting really, really still and rigid and their hands are in their lap and they're not able to move any part of their body at all to do this, you're not gonna get to the point where they're just gonna reach out and hand you something. So you have to shape that very carefully. And so you might start with the smallest movement where they're just tapping the tip of their finger and then maybe they're pointing with one finger and it might be a very discreet point at first where it's kind of in their lap and you can't really see it. And then you shape that to getting further and further away from their body um, and then reaching for an item that's nearby. It might be right next to them and they reach right next to their knee and pick something up. And then they reach a little bit farther where they have to move their body and stretch a little bit and pick something up and eventually get to the point where they can reach out and hand something to people. 
And so that might be really helpful. Same thing, um, you can work on that. You can shape something if you need the child to practice walking into the room or walking to a table. Start with just tapping their toe and then pointing to something with their toe and then kind of shuffling their foot forward a little but not taking a step yet and then taking one step and then a few more steps. So again, using those components of shaping that we talked about and thinking about how that might help kids just establish some basic movement to get into the space where you're gonna start working on your brave talking. Um, once they're in the space, you might need to continue working on just establishing movement. And again, it's helpful to start with movements that are away from the mouth and face and slowly move closer to that. So you might start with things like moving your toes or moving your fingers and then moving your arms and legs and then getting closer and closer as you kind of move up the body, like shrugging your shoulders and then tapping your head and then your nose and then eventually getting to your mouth and trying things like, can you open your mouth really wide? Can you puff your cheeks? Can you stick out your tongue? and getting kids used to using their mouth and having other people see them when they're using their mouth can be really helpful for some of our kids, especially our kids that really have that social anxiety component and they don't like to be watched or they don't like people to see them moving. Um, so of course, as you're doing these types of activities, we really want it to be fun. We really want it to be engaging. Kids are more likely to do hard things when they feel fun and exciting and engaging. And often kids are more likely to do it when it feels silly. So thinking about games like Simon Says, there's lots of silly YouTube videos that encourage all kinds of movements to follow along with. You can play games where you act out winter activities or act out something you did this weekend or use stuffed animals to do things. And you have to move like the stuffed animal or make the stuffed animal move like you. So there's lots of fun ways to do this. For some kids, it may be helpful initially if you decrease your eye contact and you're not looking directly at them as you're expecting them to do these new activities and then kind of build that back in. Um, and for some kids, they may do better in a larger group setting because they feel like the attention is on all the people around them and not spotlighted on just them. They may do better in a group. Other kids may really struggle in a group and do better one-on-one. -on -one. So kind of experimenting with some of those variables and seeing what works well for this student. These are some ideas, it's certainly not a comprehensive list of um, some games that you can do to kind of encourage movement. Um, certainly like Simon says, um, these are some games that you can get off of Amazon or at pretty much anywhere that sells card games um, that have you do different things like high fives and fist bumps. The Taco Cat Goat Cheese Pizza game does involve talking so you can modify that so it doesn't involve talking right away if you're not there yet. And then just games with fun things, like everybody loves to play with balloons and beach balls, um, doing things that are really active, like scooter boards, if you have access to that. Playing a game like this or that, where you read a choice, like, do you like summer or winter better? And if you like winter, you run to that side of the room. And if you like summer, you run to that side of the room. Or you jump to that side, or you skip to that side, or you gallop to that side. You can make it really creative. And then really any of those gym games that kids might already be familiar with from school. So things like, what time is it, Mr. Fox, Red Rover, Tag, Hopscotch, Beanbags, or Cornhole, all those types of things can be really fun and be a nice way to get kids moving and help relieve some of that physical tension that they might be feeling. So I also like some kids find it really helpful to work on just establishing airflow. So if you've got a student who's really not ready to talk at all, they're really struggling with even just getting one word responses out, again, you might have to really step back and do this very incrementally. So once they're more comfortable kind of moving their bodies, now we might need to work on activities where they're using airflow, not using their voice yet, but just getting air to come out of their mouth. And there's lots of fun ways to do this. If you look up just like arts and crafts or like blowing games or activities or things like that, you can find lots of things on Pinterest or on teacher websites. Um, there's a couple examples here and I have a list of kind of some basic tools that can make this more fun and more exciting that you might consider adding to kind of your toolbox. Um, in this top picture here, it's called straw painting or firework painting. You put some paint on a paper and give kids a straw and they have to blow the paint really hard to make different designs. Um, this picture at the bottom, they used different colors of tape to make different types of tracks and then gave kids a pom-pom ball or a cotton ball and they had to use their straws to blow them along the tracks. Um, you can turn this into a race between you and the child. You can just have them do it themselves. Um, and these are rocket launchers where you blow into the straw and the harder you blow, the further the rocket flies. So you can make all kinds of obstacle courses and make your rockets fly all around the room or try to get them to land in a certain spot or land on certain planets. There's, there's lots of fun things you can do with that. These are some other examples of activities that we've done in some way, shape, or form. Um, so sometimes there's these fun party horn blowers that like pop out really far and make fun noises. If you pair that with something that's sticky, that has just like a tape donut on the back or sticky tack or something sticky, you can blow it out like kind of a frog tongue and catch things. So like in this game, they're pretending they're a frog and they're catching the bugs for the frog. 
Um, lots of kids love to blow bubbles into their drinks. And so coming up with either a bubble solution or a, um, a little bit of water or a drink in a container and giving them a straw and letting them just blow and blow and blow and see if they can fill up the jar or make it come all the way over the top of the jar can be really fun. You can turn it into a game. And so there's games here like um, moving the cotton balls from one bucket to another. So using a straw, you kind of have to suck in to hold the cotton ball, transfer it over and then blow it out to let it out. Or something like this where you're using paper towel tubes and you're blowing ping pong balls and trying to get them into different targets to score points and things like that. So just a couple of ideas. Like I said, there's tons and tons of ideas out there. They're typically very easy to do, um, but these can be really fun and engaging ways to get kids ready to start using their vocal mechanism to start talking, even if they're not there yet, um, in a way that's more comfortable and less pressure than actually talking so far. So establishing that airflow can be a really helpful piece in moving them closer to using words. Once kids have that airflow piece down and they're feeling pretty comfortable and confident with that, then we wanna start working on just the voicing piece. So again, not necessarily words yet, but just getting them used to the fact that they can use their voice, that it's safe to use their voice and have other people hear their voice, that they can play around with their voice and have vocal control over their voice um, and making that a really fun activity for them. So if you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend this book that came out in 2021, Echo, um, written by, by Cesar Ruiz, Evelyn Klein, and Louis Chesney. And it's a fantastic book that really looks at very specific ways of helping kids get from nonverbal to verbal. And the whole first module of this book just talks about establishing voice and vocal control. And it really moves very incrementally there. So it's a great book, great resource, comes with lots of practical activities. Um, so I would suggest if you have a client that that would be helpful for, this would be something to look into. Some of the ways that you can work on voicing, um, sometimes it's helpful to start with humming. This can be good because it doesn't require kids to open their mouth. You can hum with your lips pursed together, and that can be a, a less scary way of starting to work on the voice. And as you're doing that, you can notice things like, oh, I notice when I hum, like my vocal cords vibrate or my throat vibrates right here. I can feel it kind of buzzing. I feel this buzzy feeling. Um, helping give kids some idea of what's going on or what they're actually doing can kind of demystify the process for them and help them feel more ownership and account and ownership and understanding of it. As you're humming, you can notice things like, oh, I can make a high pitch. I can make a low pitch. Um, I can change the volume. I can hum really loud. I can hum really quiet. I can hum for a really long time or a really short time. And you can turn this into games where maybe you hum something and the child has to match it, or they hum something and you have to match it. Or you play different games where you have to, um, you know, playing with some kind of board game or something. When you get to a certain space, you have to hum three times or hum for every space you move, or there's lots of ways to kind of make it more interactive. Another way you can do it is by working on just vowel sounds. So like A, E, O, U. Um, and again, you can kind of vary what's the pitch and tone of it. How long can we do it? How long can you hold one single sound? And you can time each other and see who can hold it for the longest number of seconds. And again, playing some of those like copy me types of games. Um, for some kids, especially younger kids, working on non-word sounds like sound effects, animal sounds especially, or sounds of transportation, just in play can be really helpful or in different types of like charades or guessing games where you have to make a sound or make a stuffed animal make a sound or make a person out of Play-Doh and they make a sound um, and have them work on making sounds that have meaning attached to them. And then this last one, I would say sometimes is really helpful for kids and sometimes I save it for later. So these social types of sounds like a gasp, like, or a laughing sound or a, hmm, I'm thinking about that or, ooh, I'm so excited sound. Sometimes these can be a really nice way of building into speech for kids and other times they can be extra hard for kids. So if you get to the stage and your kid suddenly gets stuck, I wouldn't press it. I would kind of pivot and move back to something else. But for other kids, it can be really helpful. And so you can do things like looking at a picture or looking at a book and figuring out what sound would this person make, um, taking turns making sounds. And then, you know, I make a sound and then the child has to point to a picture of how I might be feeling. And then they make a sound and I have to point to a picture of how they might be feeling. So again, just thinking of ways that kids can kind of play with their voice and start to feel that sense of control over their voice before we add on that layer of language on top, which can just make things a little bit trickier and complex. All right, I'm just peeking at the chat here. I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna keep going. These are some apps. Um, last I checked, these were all available for free. I'm sure there's many others. 
Uh, but these are some apps that can be really fun for working on voicing. And even as you get into language for working on things like volume, because they're responsive to sound and volume. And so they do all kinds of different animations and things. And the louder you are, the more dramatic the animation is. So you can really um, use this to help kids uh, who are maybe at a very low volume, those low audible kids, or even whispering, help them kind of move into using a louder volume. Um, and it's a very visual way of kids seeing the differences in that. Um, I included the spinny wheel too. This you can use for lots of different things, but you can basically program your own spinner and you can put whatever you want on it. So you could put the different sound effects that you've been practicing on it um, or the different airflow activities. Like if you get, you know, one might say you have to blow out candles. One might say you have to moo like a cow. One might say you have to say ah or e. And then you take turns spinning that and doing the different activities. So these are just some resources. There's probably lots of other great ones out there as well. Okay, so now that we've kind of got those prerequisite skills established, kids can do some basic movements, they can control airflow, they're able to use their voice comfortably. Um, now we can start to move into how do we shape those skills into meaningful words and get this child able to respond to questions and, and use their voice in more socially meaningful ways. So one strategy for that that has been really, really helpful um, is something called the Ritual Sound Approach. This was created by Elisa Chapon Blum at the Smart Center. Um, and there's lots of variations out there that I've heard of it. I've heard it called the Structured Sound Approach and, and some other things. Um, but the basic premise is you start with some kind of item um, like a feather or tissue paper or a cotton ball, something that's gonna be responsive to airflow. And you start at kind of the stage of airflow you move to single sounds, and then you eventually shape that into individual words in the context of it being a game. And so um, what that might look like is starting with some voiceless sounds. So in English, we have a set of sounds that are voiceless and a set of sounds that are voiced. So voiceless sounds are just created out of airflow. They don't require our vocal cords at all. Voiced sounds do require our vocal cords and, and are obviously louder and have voicing to them. So starting with those voiceless sounds that produce airflow, like or or those are all things that air is coming out of our mouth. And so you can use those sounds to make your object like your feather move. So it might look like me holding up my feather and saying like, okay, I'm gonna make my feather move like this. Now it's your turn. You make your feather move the same way. And the student goes and has to make their feather move the same way. And you practice that lots and lots of times. You practice it getting it really fast, making it move a lot. And you really focus a lot on how the feather's responding, not so much what the child's doing. Um, so it kind of decentralizes that focus a little bit and doesn't make them the center of attention. And so then as they're able to start doing that, you can start combining a couple different sounds. So now we're gonna do, okay, you do it. And you change those sounds. And once they can start to do combinations of sounds, you can start to put those into nonsense words. So you might combine sounds like eh, and have the child do that. Um, because it's a nonsense word, kids are often more easily able to do that because it doesn't carry that same um, weight and social expectation of I'm using a real word yet. So sometimes those nonsense words are a really great, great way to start integrating vowel sounds and getting voicing in there and using a, a word without it feeling so much pressure as like I'm talking and answering a question. As you get some of those nonsense words in there, now you can start to think about what's a what's a word that is meaningful to this child that I could shape and have them do incrementally and then use as a question. So if you know their favorite color is pink, you might start to shape ink. Now you say ink. And once they can do that, you can say, okay, now I'm going to ask you a question and you're going to make your feather move that same way. What's your favorite color? And they say ink. So they're starting to use language to answer questions. Um, I will say this is one situation where I have had some success. Um, thank you, Kristen. Kristen just put the link to both the Smart Center and the Selective Mutism Learning University that I referenced earlier that has the CDI and VDI skills. Those are in the chat now. Um, this is one situation where I might use the words yes and no because they are short words and only have two or three sounds. They're easy to shape. And once you can get the kid verbally saying yes or no, you can practice asking them questions and having them respond yes and no. But I would just make sure you don't get stuck in those yes or no questions. Try to move on to other words so they can answer forced choice questions as quickly as you can reasonably. So as you're doing this activity, just to kind of give you an idea of what it might look like, I usually make some kind of chart like this. It doesn't have to be fancy. I just draw it on construction paper or a whiteboard or whatever I have nearby. Um, although for one student, we did get kind of fancy and make one that was you know color coded and had unicorns on. But again, it can just look like this. So starting with some of those individual voiceless sounds, starting to combine them in two and three sound combinations, starting to shape those nonsense words, and then shaping them into actual words like yes. And then to the point where they're saying the whole word yes instead of yes. 
So again, very, very incremental. And you can move as quickly or as slowly as you need to for the student. So your first session, you may only get up to, you know, these first four stages and that's as far as you get and that's okay. Then the next session, you might get up to maybe the nonsense words and then eventually you get up to the whole words. Um, the goal is once kids can kind of get to those whole words and use a full word, we want to start generalizing that to other people. So you might start inviting in a teacher and showing them how you play this game and in involving them. And now the child knows what to expect. And so they can kind of demonstrate and, and model what the teacher needs to do, or you might do it with a peer. Um, so you can do that generalization piece if the child's ready for that. You can also wait on the generalization and really build the language skills and come back to generalization. Again, depending on kind of your style and your situation and the needs of the child. Um, just for your reference, uh, this is a quick list of the voiced and voiceless sounds in English, so you have an idea of what those might look like, um, as well as another way of classifying sounds, which we call fricatives and stops. So a fricative is a sound where air is escaping and you can prolong it, like f or s. You can make it a really long sound. A stop is a very quick sound and you can't prolong it. So like p is a quick sound. You can't draw that out. Um, so again, thinking about sounds where you might need to make that really long stream of airflow or make that quick burst of airflow, just kind of for your reference. Um, and all vowels are voiced sounds, just so you know. Okay, um, we keep moving along here. We're doing good time-wise. So um, just wanted to kind of uh, start to wrap this up by thinking about some other basic strategies that might be helpful as you're building speech in these new situations. So again, we've really talked tonight about breaking things down into the tiniest little incremental steps. Um, and now we're gonna talk about other supports that you might need um, in addition to those tiny incremental steps to really support speaking. So if you're really targeting working on speech in a new location, um, thinking about all the things that you can do to make that location feel very familiar and comfortable to the child. So if it's a local area, like a new playground, a new school, um, visiting several times, having the parent drive by, get out, look around, explore a little bit. Um, if that's not possible, if the child's getting ready for a field trip and maybe it's not reasonable to go drive to the site of the field trip, look at pictures online. Uh, there are so many resources where you can take virtual field trips. So you can look at a zoo online and actually see what are the animals there and what are the different um, activities there and what might the pathways look like and you can kind of take that tour. It's also been helpful for me um, for families who are getting ready to go on vacation and their, their child had a lot of anxiety about going to a new place that they had never been to. Look up pictures of that vacation destination. Look up videos about it. Um, try to make it feel very comfortable and have those conversations about what do you think we're going to see? What do you think we're going to hear? What do you think we're going to do when we first get there? And help kids to have some kind of expectation for what this new location might be like. Um, as you're, if you have the opportunity to go to new places, you could practice some movement activities there. Even if kids aren't able to talk there yet, they might be able to work on some of those behavioral engagement strategies and work on just um, that physical um, integration piece. Um, you can take pictures and make books and review and practice it. Again, making it very familiar and comfortable to the child. And it's always helpful when families can bring an activity that's really familiar to the child, maybe as a favorite activity for the child to help encourage speaking. So if your student loves Spot It, bring Spot It with you when you go to that new acti when you go to that new place. Don't bring a brand new game they've never played before and might feel, not feel comfortable with. Um, so having some idea of some of those games that are really motivating for your kids or activities that are really motivating that are most likely um, to encourage speaking for them. By contrast, if you're really working on speaking with new people, um, again, you might be able to use some version of the fade-in process, but just with much, much smaller incremental steps. Um, sometimes I've found that I might start by trialing a fade-in and it really doesn't work initially. I go back and try some of these steps we've talked about tonight, like the movement and the airflow and the voicing. And then once we've established some of those prerequisite skills, we can go back and try a fade in again. And sometimes it's much more successful now because the students got a lot more of those skills and is a lot more comfortable with those skills. Um, if it's not possible to have your familiar person like your parent come into your setting, is it possible to have them on a phone or a laptop screen? Um, you can also, by contrast, um, if the child is verbal with the parent in the new situation, but as soon as the new adult comes in, they completely freeze and they're not able to talk. Sometimes it's helpful to, before that new person even comes in the room, have them on Zoom on a laptop at the back of the room and get the child used to speaking to the parent while the person's on the laptop at the back of the room and then moving the laptop closer and closer and then going back and introducing the person in real life. That can be an intermediary step that's helpful for some of our kids. Um, another strategy can be, as the familiar person joins the interaction and is with the child and parent, 
If the child's verbal to the parent, but as soon as the new person asks a question, they're not able to answer it, have the new person and the parent ask the same question at the same time. And then slowly you can have the parent fade out their response. Maybe the parent starts the question and the new person finishes it, or the parent says the first word and the new person says the whole part of the word. So again, using those really intermediary steps to help the child be able to transfer that speech. Those are some things that have been helpful for us. And then just some general considerations um, to take into account, which you may be doing already. As kids are ready, involve them in the process of coming up with their goals, of setting up their bravery ladders, of thinking about the steps of, of doing the shaping process. Um, really young kids can do basic things like sorting things into a pile of what's easy and what's hard. Uh, you can write steps on cards or take pictures of different places in the school and have kids make a pile. These are the places that are easy for me to talk. These are the places that are hard. Or these are the places I want to practice first. These are the ones that I want to wait on. Um, and then having kids brainstorm what might make this easier or harder and seeing if they have ideas that could be really helpful to your process and helpful for you to consider in terms of making them more comfortable and making this a more manageable process for them. Um, also giving kids choice as much as possible, but keeping in mind, we want to make sure all of our options are acceptable. So we don't want to say something like, we're going to practice ordering. Do you want to order it or should I? Because that gives them the option to kind of avoid and let the adult do it. Instead, it could be, we're going to practice ordering. Should we go to Dunkin' Donuts or Dairy Queen? So either option that they pick is fine because you can still work on the same skill, but they have some involvement and ownership with that. And then as we talked about, um, considering changing up the reinforcement. So if you've been using the same type of reinforcement um, for a while, maybe it starts to fading in its effectiveness and you may need to change that up to be something different. Maybe if you've been using a lot of concrete items like stickers or toys, maybe you switch it up and make it an experience. They're working to stay up 15 minutes later. They're working to pick the movie for movie night. They're working to have dessert first before dinner. Whatever's motivating for them can be really helpful. Um, so changing up rewards can be helpful. And sometimes you just need to really up the ante a little bit for these really hard situations. So if kids are really getting stuck at a certain situation, you might need to really up that reinforcement for that big hump to help them get over it. And then again, fade that once they get more consistent with it. Okay, um, I'm looking at a question in the chat here. Um, okay, I'm gonna, so the question in the chat is looking at like the SMQ, what score is considered severe? What do you consider improved and expect to see as improvement? Um, so things like asking a teacher a question, asking school staff, what kinds of suggestions do you have? So there's, there's a number of questions there. Um, so the SMQ I find can be really helpful for giving, the SMQ is the Selective Mutism Questionnaire. It's available for free. Um, I think it can be really helpful for getting a snapshot of where the child is. I don't find it to be very helpful for measuring gains that the child's showing in therapy, especially if they're more incremental gains at first, because it can take a lot for the child to move from a rating of like rarely to, or seldom to rarely or, or something like that. It takes a lot to move from one step to another. And so um, I would kind of look at more specific data in terms of like, what's your child's goal? Thinking about that bravery ladder. If their goal is talking to their teacher at school and it's 10 steps to get there, keeping track of each of those steps. So they've accomplished step one, keep track of that. And when they first accomplished it, now they've accomplished step two, now they've accomplished step three. So I would look more at progress that's specific to your child and their therapy plan and their goals. And I think that'll give you a better sense of their progress. Um, the SMQ is a much more broad measure. And like I said, it won't always show you progress from session to session or from month to month. Um, sometimes it's better for measuring much longer term process progress rather than shorter terms. Um, another question is, if my child has to go outside the classroom to answer his teacher, how do we transition to answering inside the classroom? So again, thinking about how we could kind of shape that behavior. It might be helpful to practice that when the rest of the students aren't in the classroom. So I'm guessing if your student's going outside of the classroom to answer the teacher, it's probably easier for them to talk to the teacher one on one instead of in a large group of students. So thinking about a time where maybe the rest of the students are at library or at gym or doing something else, and you might have five or 10 minutes that the student can practice one on one with the teacher, have them start outside the classroom with the child answering questions from the teacher in the hallway like they're doing already, then take one step in the classroom and practice doing it, then go further in the classroom, then maybe get all the way to the teacher's desk and practice doing it. And then maybe the next day or the next week you practice that and while you're practicing, um, one peer comes in to get something from his desk and then maybe the next day a couple peers come in. And so you slowly start to add in more people in the environment and get the child used to more people being there until he can do so or she can do so in a larger group. Um, another question, if a young child age four is not interacting with peers at school and is not interested in play dates, should we still plan them? How much should the parent be involved and how do you fade in children on the play date? Great questions. 
Um, I do think it's still really helpful to keep giving kids opportunities to um, engage with peers. Um, it may be really hard for kids, especially our young kids, to express the fact that, yes, they want to play with their peers, and it's really hard, and it's really uncomfortable, so they're going to say, no, I don't want to play date, or no, I don't want to play with peers, because it's hard for them to express kind of all those feelings they might be feeling. Um, and so, uh, sorry, I just lost the question here. Um, and so thinking about ways that you can kind of make those play dates um, more manageable for the child. So um, are there any extended family members that maybe the child's a little more comfortable with, a cousin or um, maybe a neighbor who lives nearby that they see more frequently that might be an easier start to play dates versus somebody from school that they've never had a play date with? Um, sometimes for kids, doing it at home can be the easiest place, but sometimes going to a neutral space like the ice cream store or the playground can be an easier way to do it. Um, so working on some things like that. You can fade in a, a child using a, a very similar approach to what we use for adults. You just have to be really transparent to the new child about what you need them to do. So it might look like inviting, you know, if your child is um, having a play date with Sarah from school, you might invite Sarah and her mom over to your house and kind of say to them ahead of time, like, my child's working on talking to new people. Um, it's really helpful to have for her to have some time to warm up before she starts talking to new people. So it'd be really helpful if you guys sit out here in the living room for right now, and then we'll let you know when we're ready for you to come into the dining room. So then you and your daughter start in the dining room, you start doing an activity, you work on getting her talking while they're in the other room. And then again, you can kind of say, oh, Sarah, you can come sit, kind of, can you come sit at the edge of the living room here and do your puzzle here? Great, awesome, thank you. Have her sit there and work while you work on getting your child verbal. And then again, slowly having her come closer and closer. So it doesn't have to be an immediate, they come to the house and the kids immediately start doing something social together. You can give some of that warm up time and use those CDI and VDI skills until it's more comfortable and kind of do that fade in process. All right, I, know, I see we have a couple more questions here, and I know we're also running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to see what we can address here um, before we have to wrap up. Uh, we recently had a social worker and psychologist dissent in eligibility meeting. Fifth grade could communicate with sticky notes. She was achieving academically, but not socially. I have another school that's questioning educational impact. Oh, this is a big question that I get a lot. So long story short, we're talking about educational impact. And I often hear the argument, the student's grades are fine. They're doing fine academically. Their grades are perfect. Their test scores are great. They're an A student. They don't need any special education. They don't need any support services. They're fine. And it's really important to remember that the national legislation, the IDEA that governs special education, talks about educational impact, not academic impact. And educational impact does, as you noted in your question, does include social. It does include academic and non-academic activities. So that means not just in the classroom, but also are they participating at lunch? Are they participating at recess? Are they able to join extracurriculars and participate effectively? Um, and so really looking at collecting as much evidence as you can of how this is impacting the child. So you might look at things, um, if you can go into the classroom and observe them during a small group discussion, how many times is that child participating in that discussion, if at all? How many times is that child raising their hand to initiate or ask a question or answer a question? How many times is that child engaging in conversation at the lunchroom table? So looking for ways you can kind of quantify and say, these are ways that it is impacting the child's educational experience because they can't do group projects. They can't give a presentation. They can't raise their hand to ask a question or answer a question. There's lots of ways they're not able to participate in their education. Um, and so this is impacting them in a lot of different ways. Um, I'm going to do one more question that I know we have to wrap up here. These are fantastic questions. Um, and I really appreciate all of these. Um, this uh, daughter is 10 years old and in fifth grade. The school is having a winter concert. She's involved in practicing in the classroom, but she will not perform when the parents are there next week. Should I encourage her or tell her that I'm proud that she's involved in her classroom? Um, I think both. So you know your daughter and you kind of know how much you can push her and maybe what's a little bit too much right now. And so it's always great to kind of reinforce and use those labeled phrases and say, I'm so proud of you for practicing. I'm so proud of you for trying this new activity. That was really brave. I know that was really hard for you. Um, maybe you can do something where if you can go to the school before the concert or on another night and she could practice um, doing it for maybe just like you and a family member or something like that. If there's a way that she could do kind of a modified version of the concert um, and or maybe she can give the concert at home and you can invite some neighbors over and she could sing a couple of her songs. Thinking about a way that she could still have part of the experience without it being the whole overwhelming experience. And then maybe if you think about, you know, if our goal next year is to participate in the actual concert, what are some things we might need to do to prepare? And you might work on presentation skills and talking in front of large groups and people or just being in front of large groups of people and things like that. 
Um, I really appreciate your questions. We do have to wrap up for tonight. Um, but thank you so much for your attendance. Uh, as Kristen said, we will send out the recording of this webinar as well as the handouts in case there's anything additional that you um, want to follow up on. And do go back to the chat. The link for the Selective Mutism University that I mentioned is there. Um, I would also refer you to our website if you're looking for additional resources. Some of the things you can find on the SMA website are recordings of all of our past webinars. Um, you can find our free downloadable educators toolkits and caregivers toolkits, which have tons of information on, on helping kids with SM and supporting them and kind of setting goals and scaffolding those goals. There's lots of additional articles that are geared towards families, towards educators specifically, and towards treating professionals. We have a whole recommended book list. Again, things that are appropriate for kids to read about this topic, for parents to read, and for professionals to read. And we've just recently launched our Educators Web Course, which is a, a great self-paced study um, for educational team members who are looking to get more information about SM and get more training on it. So I hope you'll check out those resources. Thank you again for your attendance and for your great questions. Um, thank you for joining us and I wish you all the best of luck.